Hello everyone and welcome back to Passion Sundays, the best way to end the week and start another. Our guest today is passionate about creating great service. He does it through service design. Graham Harvey, thank you very much for being with us today. You're welcome. welcome. What an My interesting pleasure. topic, service design. So you're not even talking about customer service, you're talking about designing the service even before you even provide it. Correct. Correct. Tell me more. Um, most people don't have a problem in understanding that there's a process that goes into the creation and development of a tangible good, whether that be a car or a smartphone or a packet of biscuits. So we understand that there is a design process, then when there's you know, construction, it gets, gets, goes through a factory, it comes out the end, and you end up purchasing the, the phone or the car or the, or the packet, packet of biscuits. So what smart companies do is they provide exactly the same rigor and robustness to the actual design of the service process as well. A lot of people also think that customer service and customer experience are sort of interchangeable terms, but they're actually opposite ends of the spectrum. Service is essentially what the business gives, which of course hopefully you've got 100% control over, versus customer experience, which is what the customer takes away. Okay. Now, the problem with the customer experience is you don't have total control over that because each customer brings a whole different set of needs, wants, expectations, and of course their background conditioning that adds to the experience that they actually take away. So in my work with organizations is, is the rigor of going through that design process. So we take the time to look at and design what is it the customer sees, what do they hear, smell, taste, touch, mm. and of course the biggie, which is the EQ in my business, Service EQ, is the emotional connection that customers have. So of course the word love has really only entered sort of just starting to enter the corporate space, but when you see organizations like McDonald's saying, I'm loving it, or Mitsubishi, love that car, uh, L'Oreal, you're worth it. It's all about emotion. It's not about the actual um, the specifications of the product itself. Mm. It's all about emotion. And of course, most of us are in the, actually the wants business, not the needs business. True. So we need to understand that most of the, the reasoning behind the purchase of a product is actually emotionally based, not rationally based. True, and I think a lot of the failure of amazing products out there uh, has been in the fact that they're servicing a need, not as much of a want where a need tackles the analytical brain, but a want tackles the, the emotional connections. Correct. And, Correct. And, and in a way, if you think about passion, if you're pursuing it from the mind, it becomes a, a I need to, but I'm not really sure that I want to. Mm -hmm. How can somebody shift their mindset to become more, I really want to pursue my passion, rather than I just have to pursue my passion? Yeah, I think that comes back to this whole ongoing battle between head and heart. And I think sometimes we've sort of come up and we've all been sort of through, uh, you know, the industrial age and then through the late, the last century and the first thing where, where people are focused more on, I guess, the economics. You know, we, we talk about, um, some people say, you know, we talk about the economy or others talking about the community. Well, economy is about head, community is about heart. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's happening is in my space is that in terms of delivering, designing and delivering service, we actually have to get into not only the heads of our customers, but more importantly, into the hearts of our customers. Because if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there are very few businesses that are out there servicing that bottom rung, which is essentially food and shelter for basic um, survival. Mm. So therefore, every other business, if you take it from the second level to the top of self-actualization, essentially the majority of businesses are actually in the wants business. And of course, in making decisions about wants, it's actually about emotion, which is about heart. It's actually not about head. No one actually needs to go and buy a $100,000 BMW. And essentially, why do they buy it? Not because of the specifications of the engine or anything else. They buy it because it feels damn good sitting behind the wheel mm. driving their BMW. It's an emotional purchase. It's not irrational. We buy it emotionally, and then we take it home and justify it economically and rationally to our partner. The, the challenge, though, when you're pursuing your passion, mm -hmm. creating that emotional experience, mm -hmm. whether you're pursuing your passion within your job or somewhere mm -hmm. else, is that there's a lot of fear attached. When you're buying a car, there's a lot of positive images. Yes. At the beginning of pursuing your passion, you might imagine that if I try this in my company and I fail, I'm going to get fired. Or yes. if I try my passion outside and I fail, I'm going to go broke. Yes. How can I shift my mindset around that? I think sometimes it just comes back to... Um, that pure, that thing called courage, and basically having the people around you who are going to support you in taking that step 
and are still going to support you whether the step works or not. Mm. So I think that comes back to that, that community of having the right people around you. I, for instance, could never work for an organisation that was not going to support me in having a go. So again, what the smart companies know is that they actually learn more through failure than success. Mm. Provided they're able to unpack the failure, what worked, what didn't work, how can we trim it, fine tune it, and then you keep moving. Whereas I think there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, so a lot of incentives in org sales organisations, particularly are built around success in terms of what the result is, rather than providing incentives for people to actually try. Mm. So again, smart companies like the Googles, where 20% of each employee's time is basically to work on a, on a project that they love to do. Yeah. So it's actually getting about love and passion back into the actual workspace that encourages people to actually have a go to try, to take that dumb idea and see if it's going to work or not. Okay, which so actually it, takes courage from both management as well as the individual. So it's a collaborative process. It's Absolutely. not that I have to find a way to pursue my passion. As, no. as a company, if no. we want to grow, we'd, we'd want to encourage employees to pursue their Correct. passion also. Correct. Correct. Because where do new ideas and innovations and new products and services come from yeah. if you're not going to create an environment that allows people to experiment and try different things? Awesome. Yes. Let's experiment with our passions. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Dan Graham. This has been an awesome interview. Thank you. All the best. I appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks. Passion. Passion. What do you think? I would really love to hear your opinion if you found this interview useful on designing your service. If so, leave your comments on the blog below and share it with your friends. And if you'd like more tools, tips, techniques, and exclusive interviews that I only share on my website, go to mustafa.com. Until next episode, live passionately. <laughs>